Hi, this is another Ask Augustine. Today I'm joined by my friend uh, James Ennis. Uh, so it's actually an Ask Jimmy uh, rather than an Ask Augustine. And um, we've have been having a lot of fun here playing together at uh, the Seattle Jimmy Music Society. Um, and so I asked all of you to uh, submit some questions and we got a ton of questions <laughs> and some great, really fun questions. So um, let's get started. How are you yeah. doing today? Uh, great, <laughs> great. I'm having fun. It's, it's nice, to, nice to be making music with friends again. It doesn't, uh, doesn't feel... It, it actually feels really natural. It doesn't feel weird, right? It's like it makes the last few months seem sort of like a weird... Bad like thing. a dream, yeah. yes. It didn't take long to somehow get back into the feeling we usually yeah. have. Yeah. And aside from the, the hair, like, I think gives it away that... Yeah. The pandemic haircut. <laughs> pandemic hair. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, it's one of those things like when uh, when we got the festival going here, uh, when we started redesigning it in this format of just streamed events, um, I was making different festivals. It seemed like every few days I was like creating a whole new festival and then things would change. It's like, okay, well, let's adjust that and make a whole new festival. And, and we were trying to plan for every possible contingency. It's like, okay, well, if people can come or if they can't come or if there are restrictions of this type or that type. The one thing that we really couldn't plan for is what if I got COVID? Mm. And so I basically just like stayed in my house for months. Right. And, and I thought, well, you know, I, I don't know. I could, I could let my, should I let my kids cut my hair? See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's, uh, <laughs> like a lion's mane. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we got some, well, let's go through some of these questions. So, two violinists walk into a bar, um, finish the joke. What do you think? Only one walks out. No, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that, that is actually it's probably dark, what would happen. I yeah, know, because yeah, violinists so. are usually, uh, uh, can get pretty competitive. It's but, funny, uh, violinists, <laughs> like, um, I think it was, in, it was only sort of when I got a little older that, I didn't have that many violinist friends. Actually. <laughs> I mainly hang out. I would hang out with like cellists and pianists and stuff. They seem a little bit less high strung, literally. Ha ha. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Boom. Um, so, are there um, are there any pieces you think not many people know, but that are really good? Oh, I think there's so many. You know, we, lot, we were, right? yeah, we were kind of talking about yeah. this just last night, right? Like, yeah, there's so many great pieces out there that but of course it's funny too how there are some pieces that um are very popular for in, a while it, yeah for and a while then suddenly they're gone right, right. And, or, yeah. or even popular in a certain place mm. um like I, I think it's fascinating how uh we were talking about this the other day i'm not sure if you're part of this how like in america when people are like oh the greek violin sonata they always are talking about the c minor the third sonata mm -hmm. but it, apparently in norway if it's like oh the greek violin sonata they're always talking about the g major the second sonata that's like the dominant one really? over there yeah huh. so yeah it's interesting and, and um, I think that like right now the, the pieces actually that you've been playing here these last mm -hmm. uh, two concerts the, the Dograni uh, string trio serenade and the boarding second quartet I think those were pieces that of a certain time in North America everyone kind of knew those pieces mm. and uh, now they've fallen off the radar yeah, again a little bit yeah. a little bit yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's always uh, it's always interesting to look at old concert programs too. Don't you find it? Mm, yeah. You're like, oh right, you know. And, and with violinists, like uh, you know, when violinists would play these recitals with you know a Handel violin sonata, like I love those pieces. But I think that it's not really done anymore. Yeah, yeah. and it's funny though. I did this this yeah. one like big recital tour up in Canada a few years ago where I, I played like. A, you know, kind of every night for like weeks <laughs> and, and uh, the opener was the Handel D major sonata mm. and, and I loved it because it was such an old school kind of thing to do you know to open with this beautiful Handel sonata but um, you know naturally there were a lot of like, young kids coming to concert like students mm. you know and Suzuki students and it's like oh wait don't they play that in like book five or book six or something like that. I'd really better not mess up in this handle so to have all these kids being like, wait a second, I can play that piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, music students are sometimes, I found like, the most critical audience. And if I think yeah. back to when I was a music student, we were like terrible when we went to concerts. We were so critical because we didn't realize how hard it actually is to walk out and perform. Um, yeah. yeah, so there's that whole thing. 
So, um, so James, how long did it take to get ready to do your re your recitals from home? They're fantastic. You had those moments <laughs> where you where you like play, uh, you know, a great take. You're super happy, and then you realize, oh, the camera ran out of battery. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, no, I, we I, gotta redo it. Oh man. It's yeah. The frustrations. <laughs> where it's like, oh wait, did I forget to turn off the refrigerator? Because then you know you get that sound. And yeah, there were a lot of uh, a lot of things like that. Though That's by the time sound, I actually yeah. started doing those projects, I had uh, I'd kind of refined the process. My wife, Kate, who she was joking, it's like, you know, the rehearsals for like the Apollo missions or something. I had my like checklist because <laughs> I, I was doing them yeah. in the middle of the night because it was the only time it was really quiet enough. So I, I was, um, you know, going to bed at like seven or something and waking up at 1030 and I had my checklist of, you know, turn this on, turn this off, adjust this, blah, 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 blah. Here's all the settings for all the cameras and the setting for the light and the setting for this, that, and the other thing. And so I had these sort of dry runs a few days in a row to get myself into that schedule. And then, uh, yeah, and then, you know... That's really intense. Wow. At, well, at that point, it became uh, a sort of thing where, well, hey, I mean, playing the violin, like, oh, I know how to do that. I can do that part. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. just turn the mics on and turn the cameras on. You, you never get as... Wet, like, when you start listening and as your equipment gets better you actually get more frustrated, yeah. I found, because you become more aware of all the little things that could be better and suddenly become aware of various hums and noises and and, and then you, I started hunting for certain lights that were making humming noises. Yeah. And, uh, and I also often do it pretty late at night because mm -hmm. you don't have any lawnmowers. Or yes, like, exactly. Or, or, but, yeah, whatever noise uh, neighbors might make. Please give us some tips on how to maximize recordings at home. It's been a struggle to find a good place to record when one has gotten used to studios and recital halls. Yeah. How do you decide on location and recording equipment and what would you recommend? So I would say that in terms of location, um, I mean, we, we both just record at home, mm -hmm. but uh, it can be a challenge if, if it's very noisy, if you're in a city and there's traffic noise, then you, then you have to somehow find a place that's quiet. You can often do a lot with sound um, once it's recorded, mm -hmm. if it's recorded pretty cleanly and pretty well. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a beautiful room. But of course, if you have a room that already sounds good, yeah. you're in a much better shape. I um, wonder if you'd, you'd agree. I, mean, I, I think this is sort of a personal preference kind of thing, but I definitely prefer to be in, uh, for, for recording stuff, I prefer to be in as live a space as possible. And recording close, you know, it's much harder, but, but I feel like, I, I don't know, for me, I remember even as, as a, a young person, you know, I had to you know, record some audition tape or something going into a studio where it's like a padded phone booth. You know, you're like, oh, we'll make it sound great afterwards. And it's like, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not getting yeah, what I need inspired. to play. Of course. <laughs> Some of the things that we do on, from home, we do send them to an engineer who, you know, then can yeah. fix some issues and, and just make the sounds a little, you know, right through their systems, their professionals and, you know, we're just like amateur engineers yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the main thing when you first get started is, I would say, don't record the sound with an iPhone. It's fine to use a phone to record the video. Uh, you know, but when it when you're uh, when it comes to the sound, iPhones tend to compress dynamics to such an extent that it will just um, it will make everything just sound much worse. So yeah, I think the first step is to get any kind of external microphone. Yeah, I mean, there's some there's some perfectly yeah. nice like uh, sort of plug and play kind of uh, yeah it'll already USB be mics. A, it'll yeah. already be a huge, huge. step up. Um, but then of course. If you get like really serious about audio quality, there's uh, you know there's no limit to the amount of money you can spend, and uh, we were talking about this at one point that like you know there's always something better that you could buy. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> you know, I, I wonder. I think your your viewers might be it might be amused that the uh, for the projects that uh -huh. we do, we we have the same microphones because we, we were in touch do. this whole thing. Yes. It's like, well, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so yeah. so yeah, well. We got some technical questions here. <laughs> How do you practice double harmonics? 
Ooh. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, how do we practice double harmonics? Well, you know what I always what I what I try to do with double harmonics is whenever there's some tricky passage, you know, like third movement of Paganini D major concerto or something like that. Mm, right, yeah. I'm always looking for as many alternate possibilities as possible. Exactly. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm happy you say that. <laughs> yeah. It's basically the, the same. There's often, I mean, it doesn't matter how you play the harmonic, as long yeah. as you yeah. play the harmonic and they're the right pitches. Yeah. Right. So uh, everyone's torturing themselves trying to do. Oh, yeah. But you could actually play. Right. Like there are uh, exactly. alternate yeah, things. Exactly. Like, yeah. Is that exactly what you do? I think that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. Oh, you, oh, you go back down. I see. Yes. That's the nasty. Yes. One. It's that 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 minor third. Well, it, yeah. this third harmonics are so uh, very dicey. They're they're awful. So uh, what I what I learned last year because I played the Paganini concerto again is that um, it's not only what you do with the left hand, the way that you make the note speak with the right mm -hmm. also matters and that there are some harmonics like fifths and fourths that like a lot of bow speed mm -hmm. they, li they like a lot of fourths but that actually third harmonics tend to speak better almost when you're a little more cautious exactly they, they're, yeah. they're, gonna, they're gonna start uh, distorting otherwise so that so that there are actually certain notes in that passage that they just have to play like a little softer yeah. than others and it's so it feels weird because I'm going like ba ba ooh, ah, ooh. <laughs> you know, like yeah that. exactly it looks bizarre <laughs> but it sounds right yeah you know I haven't played that piece for a while but I remember at times it's like well is this note going to speak better on an up bow today or on a down bow today oh, like it was really, yeah, 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 yeah on this yeah. fiddle like sometimes there were certain notes you could kind of hook them on an up bow yeah. but on a down bow they didn't quite have the same. Because it's like with a harmonic, you know, the start of the note is kind of everything, right? To get to get that right, going. Right. Yeah. And um, like well, end of the Britain concerto, at the oh, first movement, yeah. like well, that's, that's another one where the harmonics, the way that they're written in the part, are like crazy. You'd never want to play it that way. Um, it usually went like this. And then for the last one, I've oh, done it curious. this way, but I've also done it this way. Yeah, that's. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah see, I find it's more in tune. Yes, and as the note gets soft, you end up you end up on an F sharp. Yes, with, because you whereas, start hearing. There's you the, another fingering where it's like it ends up. Well, the thing is, not quite when you get spot. when you play a fourth harmonic. Yeah, that's eventually it. when it gets soft, you start hearing the upper note. You start hearing yeah. the B natural, but when it's a fifth harmonic, you start hearing the upper note, which yeah. is actually. An octave lower one than the note you actually want to play, so it's, it fits the harmony mm -hmm. better. It's not an extraneous note, but this brings me to the next thing, which is I think your pinky is a little longer than mine <laughs> because when I was doing this, it was always such a slightly painful stretch that eventually I actually went back to doing just because I it's like ah, I can't mm -hmm. do this, mm -hmm. and we have very different. Wait, I've always been fascinated when we were playing together, like looking at uh, how you hold the violin and 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 how your the form of your left hand because mine is very different, and mm -hmm. I think it has to do with actually the shape of our hands. Yeah. And I was recently making the point on an Ask Augustine that you have to adapt your technique to uh, the way your body is built to the shape of your hand, the length of your arms, your arms are also slightly longer than mine, and I think that has to do with, that connects to how you hold the bow, that it's different. Yeah. And in my case, slightly shorter pinky, so I kind of have the violin sitting over here, mm -hmm. not very deep in inside the thumb, and as a result, I can reach around here and uh, do that better. But because your reach is so great, you have the violin deeper down it's it's a little bit more like this right yeah um, I yeah i can't yeah, quite do it but the um yeah. the other thing is that i've got a very very wide amount of space right here and so mm -hmm. if i were to play sort of in a more traditional yeah. way like i would just be kind of flying around oh there's like way too much space there's way well. too much space there yeah so um playing a little bit more up like in here it, it just it sort of tells and, me where i am I and guess. you touch here with the 
side of your fingers? You're always like sort of in contact? Yeah, I'm usually in contact right It's funny because I, I have Actually, a... Actually, when I go into position, though, of course I'm not. I try to have a like a cavity there. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're doing... That's it. It just goes to show that you can... There are many ways like to yeah. play the violin. Yeah. And it kind of has to be tailored to... What's funny, I mean, playing an instrument is a weird thing, right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a totally strange thing to do. But, but uh, I think that it's such a complicated and intricate thing to do that we, understandably, we violinists get really caught up in how to do it. But it's like there's no, there's no point whatsoever in doing it unless it's what it sounds like. You know, and I, I think for any musician... Um, the most important thing to remember is it's not what you're doing, it's what comes out. <laughs> right. Have you changed, have you radically changed your opinion about the piece before? Like, the piece, like, you really, yes. really hated it and now you love it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely, that's absolutely happened. Um, I mean, I, I would never say that I, I certainly never, I mean, it's terrible, I never hated the Elgar Violin Concerto. I just was like, when I was a little kid, though, I was like, it's too long. This piece is, like, <laughs> I, it just, it just kind of didn't do anything for me. Like, I had, I mean, this is so funny to think about now, but I had a recording of the Elgar Violin Concerto that when I was really having trouble sleeping, I would put it on because I just could never make it through a wave. <laughs> and then and now you play it all the time. It's right? one yeah. of my absolute yeah. favorite. I mean, my daughter's initials are from the Enigma Variations. They're after Lady Elgar. I mean, like, he's been a huge figure in wow, my life. Yeah. So I, it's yeah, it's it's there. Definitely have been have been pieces like that where I just haven't. It hasn't gotten me at the right time. But isn't that a great thing about music? How it, the experience of listening to music, it has so much to do with you and who you are at that moment and how you are at that moment. And, and I think that that's you know, the magic of going to a concert. Like sometimes it's a great concert, but you are, for whatever reason, at your most receptive. And it just becomes this unbelievable event that can never really be replicated, but it just kind of changes everything. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> All right. Well, this was a ton of fun. It was uh, great fun. Thanks so much for chatting with me, and I hope Pleasure. some of these answers are helpful. And see you next time.